first question would be, how did you actually start to do uh, investigative uh, journalism? Oh, see, that's almost a trick question because I don't differentiate between investigative journalism and just in, in, in good journalism or reporting. It's a, it's a matter of asking questions that people don't want you to ask and trying to find out things that they're trying to hide. And um, I, I think I made that switch from feature writing about 20 years ago um, when I began to look into uh, Indian gambling and uh, environmental issues in, in, in Michigan. And um, uh, it, it, then it became a matter of picking up the tools to find things people don't want you to find and, and, and you know, adding to, to that skill set. But, um, but any kind of reporting that asks questions like that, I think, is investigative journalism. Um, the uh, series of articles with which you actually won the Pulitzer Prize was about the Florida insurance nightmare. How did you start working on that? It took you two years to put it all together. Yeah, two years for that project, but the stories actually, and the, the inception of the project dates back to the eight hurricanes that moved across the state in 2004 and 2005. And, and essentially left no part of Florida untouched. The damage was so severe that we saw very quickly how important property insurance is. And then the insurance companies began leaving the state and um, raising their rates and tripling their rates until they were the highest in the world. And people were literally losing their homes and being forced to move out because they couldn't pay those bills. And um, uh, it, it the, I tried covering that story as a legislative reporter, covering the political angle of it, covering the business angle of it, and eventually it just became obvious to me the only way to get to the root of the problem was to to treat it like a full investigation. I wound up changing employers in order to do that um, and and then spent two years of of every day, every weekend almost um, you know working on that one story. Um, we also have a question from um, Steve Katz, from, uh, an editor of uh, Mother Jones, who said, it would be interesting to hear her opinion on why the U.S. business press failed so badly in covering the events leading up to the collapse of the housing market in two, 2008 and the role Absolutely. that the banking industry played in that collapse. Ab Absolutely. Um, I saw a lot of parallels with the, the uh, housing uh, industry and the subprime mortgage crisis with the insurance industry at the same time. They're actually two facets of the same industry, which is um, a, a securitization of risk and and packaging and reselling risk. Um, the risk of homeowners uh, not paying their mortgages or the risk of a hurricane of taking out communities and and they're bought and sold by the same hedge funds and the same bank managers and in both cases the I found the, the mainstream press the financial press even the specialty trades press were turning a blind eye to the larger problem I think there's a willingness to especially in financial matters and more complicated areas of reporting to accept what experts tell you and not do your own independent fact-checking and um, a willingness of reporters to allow themselves to be told that they aren't smart enough to figure it out on their own when in fact it's not rocket science even if it were rocket science reporters have the tools these days to to peel that apart and and, and get to the root of what, what's really happening so complaints let's say really yeah. so I would I'm very curious uh, of one thing um, how has your work changed. I actually read about the uh, incredible work that you did with the databases. How did your work change with um, the use of new technologies and social media, for example? Uh, it's it's um, cha been changing constantly. Uh, as these new tools become available, uh, it, you know, it's like a constant game of staying current with them so that you can use them and put them to, to 
to use right away. I, I mean, 10 years ago, um, I was in, when mapping um, was one of the, you know, in its early stages, and I began using that as a way to look at lead poisoning in, in Detroit, in the inner city. And um, uh, when the internet, when the, the web uh, first became available about that same time, I was one of their, I had a National Science Foundation grant to, to find ways to use it. So um, it, it's a matter of, as they come online, you know, you being adept at, at seizing them and putting them to use, trying to think of ways that they, you can put, use those tools for what you're doing. Um, so, how do you think uh, social media has changed the way journalism actually works? Um, it has. I don't use social media the way uh, like Facebook and Twitter um, to a great extent in my own work. In part because I don't want to tell people what I'm doing until I'm ready to release it. Okay. Um, if I were doing a daily beat, I would be tweeting and, and developing a, a following all the time because it's so instantaneous. It lets you get access to people. But in, in this last project, we used um, the web pages and we made our data available to viewers online and they could type in information and get customized information back to them that let them essentially write their own narrative, their own sto story in addition to the ones that we wrote. And that's a, a, a immensely, I think, powerful new tool. You, it, it's a different way to tell the story, and it, and it lets someone um, see how it affects their own life, uh, which always gives you much greater impact. Um, talking about Twitter, um, I have another question from one of our oh, oh. readers. <laughs> I do have to interrupt. I use Twitter and Facebook as a rep as a way to gather information. I, I do have to say yes, yes. I I check out. I mean, it's a way to background sources very quickly, as as well as to check out. I put together social networks to see who is talking to who, and figure out where someone is within a larger web of people, and that sometimes helps me get to the center of the web quicker. Yeah. Yeah, and talking about Twitter uh, and the way it's used um, right now, we have uh, another question from one of our readers, um, Giorgio Fontana, and uh, he wants to know what you think about um, what two Italian journalists have stated about Twitter during the last few weeks, um, Gianni Riotta and Michele Serra. I'm just going to synthesize it for you. Basically, sure. they wrote... Um, two articles separately um, condemning Twitter because 140 characters are just too short it's just <laughs> it's just not enough so uh, one of them actually said that if if he were on Twitter he'd do terrible because mm -hmm. he, he's not capable of, of doing that so what do you think well, about that if they've been tweeting about it then they've instantly <laughs> proved him wrong because then you get an, a, an ongoing dialogue on, on, on Twitter. I, um, I have to note that, that 144 times 2 is 288, and, and you're not limited, in other words, to a single tweet. Um, I recall a reporter in, an, um, oh, in, in one of the Arab Spring countries um, who was actually picked up by police and um, assaulted and then jailed and she used Twitter to get her story out and not just on her own phone but then once she was um, you know thrown away into a secret prison found other inmates who had access to cell phones and continued tweeting from there and and it was an amazingly compelling story um, you know that 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 emerged from that when in part, others took those tweets and put them back together, reconstructed them back into the fuller story. So uh, it has value. It can be very misleading, though, too. I mean, I was covering an event. Someone was tweeting about the event as though they were there, and it turns out they were not. Um, it, you know, it was fictitious, and, um, and that's a danger. 
so you have to take it with a, a grain of salt. And I'm sure that that its propaganda um, abilities have, you know, um, will be seen too for, you know, to be used by people trying to send false messages. Sure. And talking about um, the Arab Spring and other other uh, countries that are currently at war. Um, Another question from Hilary Fisheye Barbie is, uh, what do you think about photojournalism and bloggers who are sent in military missions? Oh, well, um, when you say bloggers, is that a distinction um, be as not reporters or reporters who blog or, you know, that that's, uh, I think reporters have been going into war zones um, practically forever and provided important critical information independent when they can and and uh, embedded with forces when when they can't and um, if it's uncensored all the better but yeah that the, I I'm the question itself raises questions for me because when he says bloggers I'm I, I'm saying why do you distinguish between them perhaps there's something you should know about the uh, yeah. Italian system of, of journalism um, mm -hmm. in the um, 30s in the 20s and 30s uh, during the uh, fascist uh, government of Mussolini um, they invented a way to control the uh, journalists and this way to control them was to create an organization to which you had to be um, enrolled in to be able to write on a newspaper and it's Pretty called the right. order of journalists if you, right. if you translate it so they give you a, a, a card the, mm -hmm. the journalist card and if you don't have that you can't write on newspapers uh, so the distinction is there basically now and there's a lot of discussion about taking in down because it doesn't have any sense of existing anymore. Yeah. So that's that's the big difference there is in Italy. Yeah. That. Well, it's you know the value of a free press it, it can um, is immense, and when when the press is not free, then the the, the reporting is censored and loses credibility with readers and as well does not serve the government system you know of a country it leads to totalitarianism and control and and and, and such so um uh, it's whether you're covering a war or covering you know a, a local political body or community council uh, the ability to speak freely and to report freely is critical um Another question from uh, our readers comes from uh, Fabrizio Bellavista mm. and uh, it actually is about the problems that are currently um, uh, actual in uh, Italy because I don't know if you've been uh, reading what's been going on anyways the new government has implemented a series of very strict economical uh, rules and uh, now a lot of people have to pay a whole lot of taxes that they just can't pay. So right. the question is, during the last 15 days, three people for uh, work problems uh, have uh, set themselves on fire. Oh. Uh, this is uh, a typically uh, oriental uh, type of protest that has been tragically used um, here in the uh, in the West. What deep meanings do you think this wants to communicate us? You, you know, we had um, uh, similar occurrences in the United States um, recently in California. I think a, a city worker who faced losing his job, which was devastating, I mean, it would um, have you know, thrown him and his, his family into, into crisis, uh, leapt off of a building and, and um, landed essentially in front of the, the barber shop of the mayor. And, and it drew attention to the financial crisis, you know, brewing in that community. That it, the, the deaths are tragic and um, in any 
country in any situation where that occurs and um, uh, one would you know hope and I'm sure the issue is being covered by the the press even without the death so that it's perhaps a needless tragedy yeah actually indeed it's it's all over the place because everybody's talking about the changes and uh, and everything oh, so I, well I once wrote about farmers committing suicide um, and we're talking now 20 years ago but there was a period in of uh, economic depression in agriculture in the US and and we had farmers killing them not not in public protest but in personal pain and the suicide rates were spiraling yeah. uh, that's the same here with um, not agriculture uh, not farmers but uh, industrial um, owners right who have perhaps you know that 15, 20 years uh, business going on with the people mm -hmm. who have been working for them for so many years and now are actually on the on the brink of of having nothing and uh, yeah there have been hundreds of cases yeah of those. yes yeah and I've heard of that in Japan and China as well uh, in in the last I mean these are very difficult times worldwide mm -mm. okay so uh, just another couple of questions sure uh, the first is um, what is journalism for you <laughs> for me it's air and water I mean it's it's I, I don't know that the question was meant that way <laughs> but but journalism is fundamental to me it, it's um, part of the fabric of a community in in uh, I've mostly worked at small organizations and um, served local readers even when I've done stories that involve traveling across the world um, the focus has always been on the change on people's lives and so my job as a reporter has always given me a very intimate connection with people in my community so that I feel very much part of the fabric of of uh, people's lives in the place that I live um, and uh, the other question would be what is currently your media diet my media diet yes. that's voracious <laughs> Good. In, in terms of uh, what do I read and listen to and yes. and for right I I um, I no longer get a paper newspaper delivered to my door, uh, but I read uh, the Los Angeles Times, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times on an almost daily basis, as well as my own paper, the Sarasota Herald Tribune, and um, and then sporadically I um, I have several newspapers that I keep a watch on, uh, the and wire services. Uh, Bloomberg News especially because I have a deep interest in economic uh, affairs and how I, th I think even though economics are um, very often dry the, the power that they have over people's lives is so great as you're seeing now in Italy with all the hardship that, um, that I feel the duty to try to understand what's going on in that world so I can watch for the impact in, in my world and, and in people around me and uh, I don't watch television news um, simply because probably of, of my hours of, of my work schedule um, but listen then to radio when I'm in the car and and uh, have news alerts I have I have um, uh, blogs that I follow and and uh, I, I guess all day long there's that flow of news coming in uh, could you tell us a couple of blogs you read on a daily basis um, one on the Everglades, um, because that's a local environmental concern, and um, uh, I'm I'm gonna, I'm stumped now for the names of them because they're on my um, I, have, I use an aggregator um, to feed me the the stuff um, through Google Alerts. Um, I, probably easier to tell you the organizations. The Center for Media and Democracy 
-hmm. and I cannot think of the name of their blog. Um, essentially, there, there's another one by uh, affiliates of the New York Times that covers investigative reporting. Uh, another one by Aaron Pilhofer, who's a, um, a, a rabidly prolific uh, blogger on um, investigative reporting and computer-assisted reporting in the U.S. Oh, Citizens for Legitimate Government. I'm sorry, that is one that I do remember the name of, because they do cover international news and uh, from a non-U.S. perspective. And as much as I like to think the American press is very unbiased, uh, I'm always amazed at the, at the diversity of coverage when I look to see what British press and newspapers in other countries are writing, and then I, I see that, that, that often there are many angles that have been missed by the U.S. papers. So.